One of these young ladies is the 1966 women's world champion figure skater. What is your name, please? My name is Peggy Fleming. My name is Peggy Fleming. My name is Peggy Fleming. Only one of these young ladies is the real Peggy Fleming. The other two are imposters and will try to fool this panel. Tom Poston, Peggy Cass, Orson Bean, and Kitty Carlisle on To Tell the Truth. To Tell the Truth is brought to you this evening by a new chiffon, the soft margarine, so soft it comes in a tub. New chiffon margarine. And here's that man. He's the voice of Superman on CBS Television's forthcoming cartoon series, the author of a second best-selling book with the whole heart, and he's the host of To Tell the Truth, Bud Collier! Thank you very much. Welcome once again to To Tell the Truth. Okay, open up that envelope in front of you, if you will, and let's get to the business at hand and read this first story together. I, Peggy Fleming, am a figure skater. For eight years, it has been my ambition to win a world's championship and thereby restore to the United States the preeminence in figure skating it once held. In preparation for the recent championship competition held in Davos, Switzerland, I practiced five hours a day, six days a week in the high altitude of Colorado. My hard work paid off. Last month, I defeated the former champion, Canada's Petra Burka, and became the women's world figure skating champion. I feel I owe my success not only to hours of practicing and inspired coaching, but also to my good luck charm, a green chewing gum wrapper tucked in my glove. Signed, Peggy Fleming. <laughs> Three young ladies all claim to be Peggy Fleming. We'll start the questioning with Kitty Carlisle. Kitty? Oh, thank you, bud. Um, <clears throat> number two, I saw something at Lake Placid, I think, a year or so ago. Was that a championship uh, figure skating? Yes, it was. Were you in that? Yes, I was. Uh, number three, were you in that? Yes, I was. Who won? I did. Ah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> number one, who was your coach? It was Carla Fossey. And number two, what did you do to win? Because I saw it. What was the thing you did? In Lake Placid? Yes. Well, I did my usual, the spins and the turns. Well, what music did you use? Music was Tchaikovsky. Uh-huh. Number three, who chooses your music? I do. Number one, where did you, where did you study in, uh, where did you practice in Colorado? At the Broadmoor World Arena. Thank you. Number two, how high is the Broadmoor above sea level? It's about 6,000 feet high. Thank you. Tom Poston. Thank you, bud. Uh, number three, do you turn better one way than the other? I like to turn to the right better. Yeah, I guess it's, it is different somehow. Uh, number one, how old are you, darling? I'm 17. Mighty cute girl to represent the United States in anything. How high is Davos, number two? It says you, you practiced uh, in a mile high at altitude of Denver. How high is Davos? Davos is lower. It's about 4,000. Thank you. Number one, where was the gum wrapper? Where did that originate? Why is that your good luck charm? Well, it was sent to me. And I'm Irish, and anything green is supposed to bring good luck. Money and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kat. Thank you. Number three, how many figures must you do? We must do six school figures. Thank you. Number one, do the judges go out and retrace the marks on the ice? No, they go out and look at them. That's, I mean. That's what they judge. <laughs> Thank you. Now, number two, how much is your free skating, the, just the free, your own you know, dancing skating count? That counts 40%. And number three, how much does the figures count? Do 60%. Figures count? 60 and 40. Thank you. Uh, did you, number one, use Tchaikovsky? What part of Tchaikovsky did you use? I didn't use Tchaikovsky. What did you use? I used um, La Traviata. Thank you. Number two, what did you use? I used Tchaikovsky. Arson B. Yes. The shocking case of the sweet young figure skater in Swampscott, Massachusetts, spinning out there and screwed herself into the ice. Number three. <laughs> Have you heard of this shocking incident that put the whole cause of figure skating back several years? You don't know about that, right? No, I don't no, believe I'm it. glad you heard. <laughs> Number two. Who? Number two. Who? 
Who is Vera Herber Ralston? Never heard, Never heard of Vera Herber Ralston. That even rules you out. Number one, uh, is a figure eight easy to do? Well, yes. How about a figure 11? <laughs> I admit it's not too graceful. All right. Thank heaven it's time to vote. So mark your ballot panel. Mark them without any consultation and, of course, without change. Once you have marked, vote now for number one, number two, or number three. Our team of challengers will, of course, receive $250 for every incorrect vote. All ballots marked? Oh, yeah. All right, Tom, for whom did you vote? I voted for number one because I'm, I'm pretty sure if Orson had asked her, she would have known who Vera Huber Ralston was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Peggy Cat. I think she's too young to even know who Orson is. But <laughs> because she said she was Irish. It sure does look Irish. Orson Bean. I voted for number three because she blanched visibly upon hearing of the disaster up at uh, Schwarzkopf <laughs> Mass. <laughs> Kitty Carlisle. I voted for number one because of her stance on the platform. Her legs were beautiful. Number three had beautiful legs, too. I couldn't see number twos. And uh, also because she looked kind of Irish. And I believe the story about the green gum wrapper. Very well, there we have it with the votes all in and the minds made up. So, let's find out now how close to the truth we may have come as we learn which of these three young ladies in truth is Peggy Fleming. Will the real Peggy Fleming please stand up? <laughs> <laughs> you know Vera Haruba Ralston? No. <laughs> there, there you have it again. Uh, number two, what is your real name and what do you really do? My name is Betsy Stein and I'm a fashion editor at McCall's Magazine. <laughs> and number three, what is your real name and what do you do? My name is Colette Dayut and I'm Miss Teenage America for 1966. <laughs> Very true. Colette and I uh, met first when I was down in Dallas emceeing the CBS television coverage of the Miss Teenage America contest last October. And it's a great joy to see her again and see how well she's carrying on the crown she's wearing so well. As for you, young lady, continued success to you. Thank you. And uh, bring home that uh, championship many times. Checking the score, we find the panel was smart. Start off tonight, there was only one incorrect vote, but that's worth $250. And our sincere thanks to all of you. Good night, and God bless you. And now let's meet our next team of challengers. What is your name, please? My name is E. G. F. Sauer. My name is E. G. F. Sauer. My name is E. G. F. Sauer. Follow along with me on this story, panel. <clears throat> I, E. G. F. Sauer, am a professor of zoology. I have recently completed an extensive study of the ostrich. Ostriches are extremely shy, and in order to investigate their behavior at close hand, I was obliged to use camouflage, disguising myself on various occasions as a plant or a tree, a rock, or even a termite mound. Since ostriches grow as tall as eight feet and weigh as much as 300 pounds, it is not surprising that they cannot fly. They make up for being grounded, however, by running across the African grasslands at speeds up to 45 miles an hour. Ostriches are unusual in that they boast a vocabulary of more than 50 different sounds. In my two years in the field observing ostriches in their native habitat, I never once saw them bury their heads in the sand. Signed, Dr. E. G. F. Sauer. <laughs> now, panel, as you heard, these three gentlemen all claim to be Dr. E. G. F. Sauer. We'll start this cross-examination with our own special ostrich lover, Orson B. Thank you. Uh, Dr. E. G. F. Sauer, number three. I was over at uh, F.A.O. Schwartz here. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. 
the Sarah number three. Uh, you, you disguise yourself as a termite mound, a rocket. You're lucky you never disguise yourself as an ostrich, because they move fast. It could have been disastrous. Number three. Uh, why can't the ostrich fly? And in your opinion, was he ever able to fly back in the dim recesses of history? To answer your second question first, yeah. it is our opinion that he never flew. Why is he a bird then, number three? <laughs> Ask an ostrich. <laughs> I think it's kind of sad, number one. I mean, if you can't sing, at least fly. Uh, how, how can you call yourself a bird? Well, he has feathers, doesn't he? Yes, I suppose. Kitty Carla. Number two, does the ostrich have an attractive sounding voice, like a singing bird? When he's a baby. Ah, what does it sound like? Oh, I can't do it like cuckoo. Aha, uh -huh, that's very charming. Oh. <laughs> Number three, where did the legend come from that they hide their heads in the sand? I, I think it's apocryphal. Uh -huh. but... Thank you. Uh, number one, I have a friend who had some ostriches on an island off Connecticut, and they were very, very dangerous. Is this true? I would be afraid of an ostrich. Uh, I think they are dangerous. They, hide, they, they hit you with their feet. They do kick. They, they kick. can peck. And they peck. Mm -hmm. Number two, do they come in different colors? No, uh, except for male and female. What is the black, male color? Black and white. Oh, black. Which is which? Well, the black. <laughs> <laughs> never know. Tom Poston. Thank you. Where do you teach number one, please? I teach at the University of uh, Florida in Gainesville, Florida. Thank you. Number two, uh, do you? No, I'm at the University of Colorado. Okay. Number two, where did you conduct your research? Southwest Africa. Thank you. Where do you teach number three, may I ask? University of California. Berkeley. Why don't you guys get together? How can I... <laughs> <laughs> number three, what are the ostrich's natural enemies? The black jackal, the black-backed jackal, is its worst enemy, possibly. Why, number two? You... Because uh, they're ferocious, and they attack an ostrich, and they gang up on them. They separate them out from the herd. Number one, can they not outrun these jackals? They can outrun the jackals. They are very fast, up to 45 miles an hour. So it says here, that's very fast, all right. Peggy Thank you, Cass. Number three, if you go on an ostrich hunt, what do you use? I wouldn't go on an ostrich hunt. Well, I know, but if one did, <laughs> if one did. I suppose one would use a gun. Well, would, would two, uh, what is a saluki? A Number saluki? two, yes. I don't Number know. Two. Oh, well, uh, it's a native. Uh, Thank excuse you. Me. Thank you. Uh, and, and number one, is there any commercial value in our friendly ostrich? That's true. You see ladies with ostrich feathers on their hats. Is that legal? Yeah, I think so. There are ostrich farms uh, in a number of places in the world. I see. No, uh, well, number three, um, can, can you sell ostrich eggs? I mean, like, uh, the lady comes on and it's a couple of ostrich eggs. Do they sell them over there? Well, people eat them. People take them. Have you ever Yes, you can. Yes, they're delicious. Oh, how very nice. And a large hole in a bag. That's it. Yeah. Time for you now to mark mm. your ballots and not communicate with each other until you have. Mark your ballots at once for the one you think is the real one and vote for number one, number two, or number three. Oh, no. All okay. ballots marked. Uh, right, Tom, for whom did you vote this time? I, I found it difficult to, uh, to choose. I guess I don't know that much about ostrich. But uh, number two seemed to be, uh, and he answered Peggy's question about that native. So I voted for number two. Peggy. Wrong. Gee, I'm glad you did that. Saluki's a dog. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, in Africa, they use Salukis because they're so fast for hunting. And I would imagine if they were hunting ostriches, they might use Salukis. I voted for three. He's from Berkeley, and everybody knows everybody at Berkeley's so smart. <laughs> Me. Well, number one said that uh, ostriches are mean. It's not true. I knew a young man who had uh, pet ostriches, and I've often seen them dancing through the meadow, hand and wing, and they're very sweet. <laughs> and number three knew about the enormous ostrich eggs, which is true. In Australia, you can hear soft moans in the countryside <laughs> during the egg-laying season. So I voted for number three. <laughs> Kitty Carlisle. Well, I voted for number three. Number two said a Saluki is a native and left it hanging. He might have said a native dog. I don't think he got a chance to finish his sentence. He was going to say and a native one... instrument. No, I don't think so. <laughs> oh, and number one either. said that uh, the ostrich is indeed a very ferocious and dangerous animal. I don't know where your charming ostriches live, but they are dangerous. There's good and bad in every race. <laughs>
So the votes are all in and mine's made up again and arguments given. Let's find out now which one of these three gentlemen in truth is Dr. E.G.F. Sauer. Will the real Dr. E.G.F. Sauer please stand up? Uh, up. Ah! <laughs> well done, gentlemen. Well done. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> wow, that really turned back on him that time. Number two, what is your real name and what do you really do? Uh, my name is Irving Brandman. I'm an assistant professor of speech at the City College here in New York. Uh Thank you, sir. And number three, you got most of the votes. What is your real name and what do you do? My name is Dick Osborne, and I am employed by the American Waterworks Association. <laughs> we check the score to your quite evident pleasure. They were all incorrect. That's four times $250 for a grand total of $1,000, gentlemen. And we thank you for being with us. Goodbye and God bless you. Now let's meet our third team of challengers. What is your name, please? My name is Dawn Nathan. My name is Dawn Nathan. My name is Dawn Nathan. Follow along with this story, panel, if you will. I, Dawn Nathan, am a Maori. The ancient people who some 650 years ago sailed in outrigger canoes across 2,000 miles of the Pacific Ocean and landed on the shores of New Zealand. We have been there ever since. There are now 175,000 Maoris in the island nation. Although today the Maoris are almost 100% literate, this was not always the case. In the early days, there was no written Maori language, and the history and folk legends of my people were passed on from generation to generation only by the spoken word and by means of narrative tribal dances. I am here in this country with three of my fellow Maoris. You will meet them in a few minutes when we perform an authentic dance called the Double Long Poi, signed Dawn Nathan. <laughs> Wait till you see that dance at the end of this spot panel because it's really something very, very special. Very well, three young ladies all claiming to be Dawn Nathan. We'll start with Peggy Cass. Peggy? Thank you. Uh, 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 number three, are the Maoris Polynesian? Yes, they are. Thank you. Number one, what is three finger poi? Uh, there isn't a three finger poi. That's a string. The poi is the thing we dance with, the ball at the end of a string. Number one, is there any other kind of poi that you know of? There's the native, uh, the uh, poi of Hawaii, which uh, uh, they eat. Thank you. Number three, are there any Maoris in Tasmania? No. Thank you. Number one, what is the capital of New Zealand? Wellington. But I keep saying one of them, two keeps asking. <laughs> Number one, what is a double long poi anyway? Uh, it's a um, uh, ball on the end of a string and we twirl it around. Oh. Arson B. Number two, where is the main uh, population of Maoris? Where, where, are, where do they live? Where do you live? In New Zealand. In New Zealand. Yes. Do any Maoris live? Uh, uh, no, they don't exist anywhere else. Now, you came there years ago, not you, but I mean your people, uh, in outrigger canoes. And this is known to be the truth, is it? That's right. We even know the amount of them. Yeah? How yeah. many? There were seven canoes. Seven canoes, and now you've got uh, 175,000 people. That's right. Well? <laughs> No wonder it's a happy race. Number three, uh, who is Sylvia Ashton Warner? Do you happen to know? No. Do you, number one? Yes, she's an author. Yes. Uh, does she have any connection? All right. Kitty Carlisle. Uh, number two, what does the ornament that you're wearing around your neck mean? Well, it's a tiki. That's yes. the name of it. And, and it has no real meaning. It's just a charm that we wear. I see. Uh, number three, how long ago did your forebears arrive in the outrigger canoes? It was about 1800. Uh, number one, how did they manage to all stay together to become, out of six outrigger canoes, a population of 100? They didn't, they didn't intermarry with anybody else? Uh, when the British came, they did, but uh, before then, they just 
Uh, it was just the Maori people. I see. Uh, number three, what is the significance of the, uh, of the headband that you're wearing? Oh, it is just an ornamental. A what? An ornamental. Uh-huh. Uh, number two, how long have they all been living? Tom Poston. Thank you. Number one, uh, where did the Maoris originate? If you, do you know? No, uh, I believe there's um, several theories, but it has never been proved. Where, where, number three, you said they were Polynesian, or that your, your people were Polynesian. Then where would you have originated if you had... Uh... Well, one theory is that we originated from Asia. Number two, uh, why are there none elsewhere? Uh, because the Maoris is their own race, they're Caucasian. They're one branch of Polynesian people. No, I mean, why aren't there Maoris uh, back... That's it. Mm. Time right. for you now to mark your ballots. No further time for questions. Just vote now, if you will. And vote without any discussion with each other about the subject. And no changing once you've marked. Mark your ballots, if you will. Can't decide for the life of me. Well, decide for the life of me, then. <laughs> All marked. Tom, for whom did you vote? I voted for number one. I think she looks like a, a dancer. Peggy Cass. Well, I voted for number one because she knew what poise, she's being a poise very thick, and also, uh, I read some books about the Maoris, and they're very happy, and number one smiles all the time. Parson. They're all very good. But number one did know Sylvia Ashton Warner, who lives in New Zealand, and uh, was a teacher and taught the Maoris, among other things. Kitty. That's why I voted for number one, too, because she knew Sylvia uh, what Ashton, was it? Ashton Warner. Warner. And uh, I thought that was good. And also, she looks happy. They all look happy, though. Sylvia Ashton Warner, any relation to Vera Huruga Ross? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay, then we have the votes all in of the minds made up. Quickly, and let's see how well we did. As you heard now, of course, earlier, uh, Dawn Nathan has promised to uh, join her group to do a dance for us. So, will the real Dawn Nathan please? Keep her promise. Tell you short on that one. Number two, what is your real name and what do you really do? My name is Vivara Barnett. I'm a stenographer with the British Information Services here in New York. And number three, what is your real name and what do you do? My name is Jean Paul. I'm a housewife and mother from Newark, New Jersey. <laughs> Checking the score, we find that the panel, feeling that they had to recoup themselves somehow, did come back with a real roar and got everyone right. So there were no incorrect. In that case, there's still $150 coming your way. And our sincere thanks for a lovely spot in our evening. Goodbye and God bless you. That's all we have time for tonight. Good night, panel. Good night to all of you. Don't forget to join us the same time next week. See you tomorrow afternoon the daytime show. In the meantime, don't forget to tell the truth. Bye. To Tell the Truth is a Mark Goodson, Bill Sotman production.
to tell the truth has been brought to you by Texaco. In all 50 states, you can trust your car to the man who wears the star, the biggest friend your car has ever had. Johnny Olson speaking. Tonight's program...